First, nothing. Then... Humanity in their primal state, hardly different from a pack of wild chimpanzees. We lived solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short lives as our forebears were stuck in a war of all against all. You see, humans are naturally domineering and hierarchical, jealous of their compatriots and quick to put down people they fear as potential rivals. For thousands of years, there was no culture, no civilization only violence. Life for men was hard, life for women far worse, as women lived in what one anthropologist described as an open season of rape. The invention of technology and agriculture changed this, allowing early humanity to develop from primitive to agriculturalists. We went from living in tight-knit bands dominated by alpha men to settlements of hundreds as warlords ushered civilization, creating order out of disorder. But selfish animals don't naturally get along, so humanity collectively forced itself into repressing its most basic instincts by creating the state, an apparatus that put the control of violence in the hands of the leader and their followers. While tenuous, these early states allowed civilization to develop to higher and higher stages. Stone tools became iron tools, and iron was used to create the technology you're watching this on now. Cities of hundreds became cities of millions. We created governments, courts, bureaucracies, and laws to hone our worst impulses towards useful areas. Violent warfare was largely reduced to economic competition with the occasional spat here and there. By no means was this process easy. It took hundreds of years of colonization, but somehow the chimps had become domesticated. We more or less live in a stable world, as stable a world as humans could ever hope to create. For we were never and will never be able to overcome our human nature, hence all the wars and genocide. Hierarchy, domination, cynical self-interest, this is the face of humanity. At least, this is a common layman's perspective of humanity's history, promoted by Enlightenment thinkers like Thomas Hobbes, whose arguments are echoed by contemporary writers like Steven Pinker. They argue that today's modern society, with its occasional moments of violence, is only an echo of our ancient past, thanks to the force for good that is civilization, technology, and specifically, Western culture. Compare the Spanish colonizers to the child-sacrificing Aztecs, or your average European country, to that of a contemporary hunter-gatherer like the Yanomami, a stateless people who are largely unaffected by Western civilization and are infamous for living a life of chronic warfare. According to some anthropologists, they're the living embodiment of the Stone Age, living the short, brutish lives I mentioned earlier. The Western tradition and the civilizing process, for all of its excesses, was fundamentally responsible for our current quality of life, at least according to this strain of political thought. And I wouldn't fault anyone for thinking this way, even if it's very, very, very wrong and racist, because this is such a default understanding of Western civilization that it unconsciously undergirds most of our ideas of the world even if we don't realize it. For example, look at the Yanomami and their supposed Stone Age living. This idea of them was popularized by the works of anthropologist Napoleon Chagdon, specifically his study, Yanomamo, The Fierce People, that's filled with quotes like, I looked up and gasped when I saw a dozen burly, naked, filthy, hideous men staring at us down the shafts of their drawn arrows. Like a lot of anthropological work from the 20th century, his work is ridden with frankly white supremacist depictions of the Yanomami people that don't reflect reality. For starters, the Yanomami are not living fossils that we can use to learn about ancient humans. They're a contemporary stateless group that's enclosed in a relatively small area surrounded by the state. 
far from being disaffected by Western culture, as anthropologist Richard B. Ferguson writes, the Yanomami make war because Western culture is present, and present in certain specific forms. All Yanomami warfare that we know about occurs within what we call a tribal zone, an extensive area beyond state administrative control inhabited by non-state people who must react to the far-flung effects of the state. Instead of living a life of constant warfare, violence was occasional, and it happened in response to their very specific historical condition. But instead of taking all of this into account, Chagnon used the Yanomami to conclude that violence may be the principal driving force behind the evolution of human culture, clearly parodying the notion of our primordial war of all against all. Not only was this shoddy work, but Chagnon's portrayal of these indigenous people was used as propaganda by Brazilian miners and lobbyists to justify their illegal invasion into Yanomami lands. The same arguments have been used against the Aztecs, the Incas, or really any indigenous society you can imagine to justify their colonization. And while I think it would be interesting to look at the nuanced case studies on the role of violence in these civilizations for a separate video, it's worth asking why this is a question even worth looking into. Isn't this a video about human history, not European versus indigenous American societies? Well, it's an undeniable fact that our ancestors probably lived closer to indigenous hunter-gatherers than to modern-day capitalists, making the difference between the old world and the new world a distinction worth looking into. At the dawn of the era of colonization, European and American civilizations clashed, not just physically, but philosophically as well as people on both sides pondered the distinctions between both civilizations and which of the two was superior. The most interesting perspectives came from the accounts of 16th and 17th century people that were able to live in both worlds, and it seems, almost invariably, that both Americans and Europeans preferred an indigenous way of life. The historical record is full of stories of members from the civilized West turning coat and joining indigenous societies, as commented on by Benjamin Franklin in a private letter written to a friend. When white people have been taken prisoner by natives and later ransomed out by their friends, no matter what their family and friends do to convince them to stay, they almost always run off to join their former captors after becoming disgusted with European life and the care and pains that are necessary to support it. I'm paraphrasing here because, you know, old English is wonky, but it's curious how common of an occurrence this was that old B. Franklin was complaining about it. He goes on to write about the opposite happening too, indigenous people who joined European society and then left as soon as they had the chance. Turncoats often cited how lonely European life was compared to life in a tribe, where people took great effort to take care of each other. No one was homeless or starving like in Western society, which is a sight that's very familiar to people living in cities today. And while Europeans were barely just escaping feudal societies filled with royal hierarchies, many indigenous societies were living out democratic values that would later be discovered by the West. In The Dawn of Everything, authors and anthropologists David Graeber and David Wengro map out the way indigenous societies influenced European thinkers. For example, the Jesuit Relations was a series of manuscripts that contained all kinds of descriptions of indigenous societies that were read and debated all over Europe. On the Innu people, Jesuit missionaries wrote, they imagined that they ought, by right of birth, to enjoy the liberty of wild-ass cults rendering no homage to anyone whomsoever except when they like. They have reproached me a hundred times because we fear our captains while they laugh at and make sport of theirs. All the authority of their chief is in his tongue's end, for he is powerful insofar as he is eloquent, and even if he kills himself talking, he will not be obeyed unless he pleases the savages. Here, they're describing a group of egalitarian hunter-gatherers where the political leader had no authority to command others beyond what they could convince people to do, 
If someone found something the chief asked or demanded disagreeable, they could just laugh it off. In comparison to the French, the Innu were people with genuine freedom. On the Wendat, missionaries wrote, I do not believe that there is any people on earth freer than they, and less able to allow the subjection of their wills to any power whatsoever, so much so that fathers here have no control over their children, or captains over their subjects, or the laws of the country over any of them, except insofar as each is pleased to submit to them. Unlike their European counterparts, many indigenous Americans had no forced hierarchies like that of a monarchy. Instead, they adopted democratic hierarchies by choice, meaning that when they believed that following the orders of another or their chief was convenient or efficient, they'd follow along. Leaders would have to convince people to follow them through logical democratic dialogue. The moment they went too far, people would just laugh them off. Try doing that to a police officer today. And surprisingly, in the Jesuit relations, the fact that these societies were so free was portrayed as a bad thing. One European wrote, The wicked liberty of the savages was the single greatest obstacle to their submitting to the yoke of the law of God. As Graeber and Wingrow explain, most of us simply take it for granted that Western observers, even 17th century ones, are simply an earlier version of ourselves, unlike indigenous Americans who represent an essentially alien, perhaps even unknowable, other. But in fact, in many ways, the authors of these texts were nothing like us. When it came to questions of personal freedom, the equality of men and women, sexual mores, or popular sovereignty, or even, for that matter, theories of depth psychology, indigenous American attitudes are likely to be far closer to the reader's own than 17th century European ones. Now, not every American indigenous group from the 17th century was perfectly egalitarian. Even in the Wendat, you had your gender differences. But taken as a whole, indigenous Americans enjoyed a lot more freedoms than feudal Europeans did. And these contradictions were highlighted endlessly by indigenous leaders like Kondiaronk of the Wendat. He asked, what kind of human, what species of creature must Europeans be that they have to be forced to do good and only refrain from evil because of fear of punishment? You have observed that we lack judges. We never bring lawsuits against one another because we made a decision neither to accept or make use of money. And why do we refuse to allow money into our communities? The reason is this. We are determined not to have laws. Because since the world was a world, our ancestors have been able to live content without them. I affirm that what you call money is the devil of devils. Money is the father of luxury, trickery, lies, betrayal, insincerity of all the world's worst behavior. Fathers sell their children, husbands their wives, wives betray their husbands, brothers kill each other, friends are false, all because of money. Over and over, I have set forth the qualities that we Wendat believe ought to define humanity. Wisdom, reason, equity, etc and demonstrated that the existence of separate material interests knock all these on the head. A man motivated by interest cannot be a man of reason. Do you seriously imagine that I would be happy to live like one of the inhabitants of Paris? To bow and scrape before every obnoxious galoot I meet on the street who happens to have been born with an inheritance? Do you actually imagine I could carry a purse full of coins and not immediately hand them over to the people who are hungry? If on the other hand, Europeans were to adopt an American way of life, it might take a while to adjust, but in the end, you'll be far happier. As Graeber and Wengrow argue, this clash between the New World and the Old World influenced Enlightenment thinkers and the establishment of Enlightenment ideals like reason, logic, and equality. To what extent is almost impossible to know, but we do know for a fact that many indigenous people were living and breathing the Enlightenment far before Europeans. If primordial human society was so violent and so primitive, how is it that indigenous Americans, people who lived closer to our ancient ancestors, were more advanced than Europeans in such a basic aspect of society? With this new knowledge, we need to turn the story back to the beginning, to the real history of everything.
living in a world of giant beasts, primordial humans were tiny little things. They had to learn to rely on each other for survival. Early humans shared meat and vegetables, shared in childcare duties, and in pleasure. Despite being smaller than other species, we were quick and nimble, and we used this speed for big game hunting. Combined with the advent of fire cooking, we had the caloric advantage to outcompete other primates and predators. But hunting is fickle business. For every successful hunt, there's just an equal likely a chance that you'll go hungry. So early humans had to structure society to be reciprocal. When we had meat, we shared among everybody. And when we didn't, we relied on gathering fruits and vegetables. Humans began to diverge from other primates by developing new methods of child rearing. Instead of selfishly murdering the children of other genetic lineages, mothers began to trust other men and women to look after the children. Combined with the fact that humans can live to very old age, meant elders along with the rest of the community became caregivers to all the children of the group. This was the face of early humanity, cooperation, selflessness, and mutual aid. The archaeological record shows that warfare among humans was exceptionally rare. When faced with disagreements and tensions, early humans largely resorted to moving out with different groups of people. Bands shifted endlessly as people knew wherever they went, they would be welcomed. And what exactly would we have had wars over? There was no accumulation of wealth, no resources to fight over when the land was abundant. All in all, life for primordial humans was pretty great. That is, until agriculture. The invention of agriculture meant previously nomadic people became anchored to an area of land and the increased output from agriculture and farm animals allowed populations to expand. Not only did humans grow in number, but the surplus and storage of food created a resource to amass. Whereas before humans moved and lived freely off the land, agriculture had created the conditions for inequality. Leaders began to amass control of food and resources and slowly this led to the development of classes. Those who worked the land and those who did not. Women lost their equal status to men who became the new owners of the means of production. When yields were low, the newly forming warlord class would raid nearby settlements leading to the first wars in human history. And the rest is a story we know all too well. As writers from the 18th century like Rousseau to contemporary ones like Jared Diamond would put it, agriculture was humanity's greatest mistake. This version of history, while I've simplified it here, is pretty common in more radical political spheres. If you're an advocate for progressive politics, the fact that humans essentially lived as egalitarian communists for thousands of years is pretty good for your side of the argument, because it fundamentally means humanity came into existence in a state of freedom. It's in our nature to live in a non-hierarchical world, and it's the state, capitalism, and hierarchy that's the aberration, not the default. If we lived in equality before, we could conceivably do it again. But some people like Graeber take issue with this line of thinking, since it implicitly condemns us to a life of capitalist inequality. If it was fundamentally the surplus of food that created the conditions for inequality, isn't there merit to the argument that without abolishing surplus value and going back to living off nature in immediate return economies, we're stuck in the shit show that is modern day capitalism? If there's resources to be amassed, inevitably there will be a bully who will seek to amass it. A vacuum of power invites a tyrant to fill it. Another question is scale. There's a certain strain of evolutionary anthropology that claims that human brains aren't evolved to remember relationships and names past a couple hundred. Pre-agriculture, humans knew only tens of people, and therefore could live in egalitarian reciprocal gift economies where everyone knew each other, they knew who was likely to share, and who was stingy and selfish. But once you increase the scale of society into the thousands, millions, and billions, you need formal institutions of government to structure society because humans simply didn't evolve for civilization at this scale. To Graeber and Wengro, this is an unacceptable conclusion, and thankfully, it's also wrong. 
human history actually isn't this simple fairy tale we've laid before you, the anthropological record is filled with examples of diverse human societies that don't fit the mold. There were plenty of pre-agricultural societies that were hierarchical and authoritarian, and agricultural societies that remained egalitarian for a very long time. One primary example in the book is societies who had fluid levels of hierarchy that shifted depending on the season. Hunter-gatherers like the Nambiquara, who during the summer couldn't be compelled to follow the chief's orders, but during the winter would allow the chief to act like a petty tyrant. If history was so simple and human nature was so fundamentally free, where would seasonally hierarchical groups like the Nambiquara fit into the picture? Or how about groups like the Tlingit, who were hunter-gatherers, not farmers, but still had a hierarchical system that divided people into classes with more or less power? Graeber and Wengro assert that these are examples of the true essence of human nature, our ability to choose, to choose the way we structure human society. They argue that humans are inherently political creatures and throughout our history have always been able to decide whether we live in a hierarchy or in equality. The question shouldn't be when did human society become so unequal. Unequal human societies have always existed. The question should be when did human society become so rigid that we became stuck with inequality. So we have to, again, go back to the beginning to create a new history of everything. Or do we? Despite the high praise the book has received by the mainstream press, it's been skewered by other anthropologists. After all, why would our ancestors choose to live under authoritarian leaders if they had the choice not to? If you have the choice to live freely or to be compelled to follow the orders of some man or woman, you'd pick the former, right? I mean, yeah, I don't think anyone enjoys following orders, whether it's from your boss or a police officer. We only enjoy the things you get if you do, namely a paycheck and getting to live another day. The obvious answer is that life under hierarchy would have to provide a basic necessity of life, like food, water, or security, that a free life wouldn't. It's the kind of no-duh answer that's made this a default understanding among anthropologists. But for Graeber and Wengro, their pursuit of crafting a narrative focused on choice has made them basically ignore this fundamental reality. I don't want to harp on them too hard, Graeber was an inspiring political figure and he passed away in 2020, and The Dawn of Everything was supposed to be a series of books, not a one-off, so I'm sure they would have addressed these concerns if they could. But human will isn't all-powerful. I can't close my eyes and compel food to appear before me. Humans are political creatures, but they can't choose to ignore the environment they exist in. The same is true the other way around. Environmental factors aren't deterministic, but they do determine what kind of changes are possible. The reality is that our ancestors living in the environment they did would have very, very few reasons to submit to dominance. That's why the anthropological record consistently shows that nomadic hunter-gatherers are politically egalitarian. In other words, free. For those that did have dominance hierarchies, we have very good explanations that don't devolve into just, uh-oh, they chose to submit to hierarchy. As we've covered, the creation of agriculture allowed for would-be bullies to have a resource to monopolize. By assuming control of food and land, you could get people to follow your orders. But agriculture isn't the only condition in which hierarchies can arise. For groups that didn't live in abundance, like the harsh environments of winter, hierarchies could arise too. That's why we tend to see seasonal hierarchies where people can't be dominated when resources are abundant, but can be forced to submit when they're not. If someone's acting like a tyrant, but you're living in the harsh, cold climate of a snowy winter, it's not like you can exactly leave somewhere else. In the case of hunter-gatherers like the Tlingit, who have hierarchies, they belong to the group of hunter-gatherers that don't have immediate return economies. In immediate return economies, food is brought home and eaten or shared out the same day, meaning no resources are ever accumulated. Instead, the Tlingit have a delayed return economy. Agriculture is one form of a delayed return economy, 
but pastoralists and foragers, like the Tlingit, who store and ferment fish, also belong to this category. This process of storage and fermentation creates the basis for those seeking control to begin exercising power over others. Our environment heavily influenced whether some would grow to dominate others, but it was by no means the only factor. Equal and free societies were something consciously fought for by our ancestors. As Christopher Bohm emphasizes in his book, Hierarchy in the Forest, egalitarian societies promoted a culture of egalitarianism in which potential upstarts are kept in check by the rest of the group. Instead of lacking hierarchy, these groups maintained a sort of inverse hierarchy, in which the weak combined forces to actively dominate the strong. Bohm writes that they must continue such domination if they are to remain autonomous and equal, and prehistorically we see that they appear to have done so very predictably as long as hunting bands remained mobile. Egalitarian societies were very creative in finding ways to preserve their societies of equals. Whether they ritually criticized game hunted by talented hunters to keep their ego in check, or shunned members who were prone to fits of rage and jealousy, or outright murdered those who made overt attempts to dominate others. For the Inuit people, public displays of emotion or intensity means getting ostracized as a potential dangerous upstart. Instead, they value those who maintain a calm, peaceful composure. For the Jutwanzi people of the Kalahari, gift giving and sharing is socially compulsory, so much so that a man given a piece of fruit as a gift will quickly count how many people are around him, split it up, and share it equally. For the Hadza, if you come across a traveler seeking shelter, you are obligated to let them stay in your home. For Europeans or Americans watching this, these social pressures might seem overbearing. I'll be damned if I split a pizza slice in 10 parts to give to my group or let a stranger in my home. We outright idolize intense and domineering behaviors as masculine ideals. And from a certain European lens, these people might not seem very free at all. After all, how free are you if you can't say no to someone knocking on your door? One thing Graeber and Wingrow do get right is distinguishing between European notions of freedom and indigenous notions of freedom. European freedom is something exercised to the cost of others. I have the free exclusive use of my car, of my computer, etc. I can trash them, beat them, do whatever I like to them, but no one else can use them. Our freedom revolves around the individual being able to do whatever they please. If somebody asks for help, we're not compelled to give them help. Our freedom comes with being able to say no, which is good for me, but what about others in my society? Is someone really free to travel even if they have no money to do so? Many hunter-gatherers would have probably argued, no. That's only freedom on paper. That's why they had so many social obligations, because someone who's starving, who lacks clothes or shelter, isn't free to do anything at all. Mutual aid and compulsory sharing, this sort of basic communism, was the basis in which they guaranteed everyone had not just freedoms on paper, but real, substantial freedoms you could act on. You always let the rare person knocking on your door stay the night because that was the only way you could guarantee a universal right to travel. Because the next time you wanted to travel, you'd want someone to do the same for you. Our ancestors were free in the truest sense, and despite the insistence of some, this isn't a freedom that's lost to time. New anthropological research shows that our ancestors lived bigger lives than we previously thought. For example, Gobekli Tepe is a pre-agriculture archaeological site that's recognized as one of the first human-made pieces of monumental architecture. It seems like hundreds of humans traveled far and wide to gather at Gobekli Tepe, whether it was for religious purposes or just to have a good time, who knows. But this challenges the notion that humans spent their lives exclusively in solitary bands. They likely lived much bigger and richer lives than we've previously imagined, interacting with hundreds of people even hundreds of miles away. And the idea that our brains can't handle the scale of modern society is ludicrous, as we don't need to know each individual in a society of millions to have an imagined sense of community. As Graeber and Wengro note, 
modern foragers are no different from modern city dwellers or ancient hunter-gatherers. We all have the capacity to feel bound to people we will probably never meet, or to take part in a macro society which exists most of the time as virtual reality, a world of possible relationships with its own rules, roles, and structures that are held in the mind and recalled through the cognitive work of image making and ritual. So is it surplus value that's our final stumbling block? I don't really think so. We can never go back to traditional communism based on kinship groups and immediate return economies. We've so grazed the earth such a life would be impossible. But we can find new ways to change the structure of society to make equality possible. After all, as Christopher Bohm writes, human nature isn't to be egalitarian or hierarchical. It's to be ambivalent. We have competing drives, a drive to dominate and a drive to fear and submit, an inclination to compete and an inclination to get along. Human nature is paradoxical, which has made us incredibly adaptive, giving us incredible societies of peace and freedom, as well as societies of utter devastation. If our ancient ancestors could learn to repress the antisocial, domineering parts of our nature and develop societal structures to keep potential bullies in check, I'm sure we can too. If you'd like to learn more, I suggest this series Critiquing the Dawn of Everything by fellow YouTuber What is Politics, or this review of the book on the monthly review by two radical anthropologists that cites a number of great reads on the subject. With that, thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. Thank you.